To fix this, there are now plans to build the world's largest solar array in the Australian outback and then connect the two nations by a nearly 4,000 kilometer undersea cable. I'm sorry, did I hear that correct? Did you say 4,000 kilometers to export solar power from Australia? Why? Hello and welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host, Sean Kenny. And before we get started, I want to ask you to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. If you like today's episode or want to ask me something, please leave your comments below. Your feedback helps us out a lot. So I was on a YouTube binge this week looking up infrastructure projects as well as architectural concepts to improve quality of life, which is a totally normal hobby and not at all weird. I came across a video titled The $23 Billion Plan to Power Singapore from Australia. In it, they describe an ambitious plan to connect Australia's power grid to Singapore via an underwater high voltage cable. The project is called the Australian Asian Power Link, or AAPL for short. It's being spearheaded by a Singaporean company called Sun Cable and is expected to begin construction in early 2023. This includes the development of one of the world's largest solar farms, the world's largest battery storage system, as well as all the overhead and undersea transmission infrastructure. Completion of this project is expected in 2028. Once completed, Australia will be exporting $2 billion a year in clean energy, allowing Singapore to import 15% of its electricity from clean solar power. It's pretty clear at this point that Australia has ambitions to be a leader in clean energy. They have bountiful amounts of sunlight that hits the outback year round. Singapore is a thriving city-state that has been looking to reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. Unfortunately, the city resides on a patch of dirt less than 270 square miles in size, which doesn't give them much room to put up large solar farms. However, given the scale, size, and expense of this project, I have to ask, is this the best that Singapore can do, or is there a better way to go about this? A few questions come to mind. First, what are the drawbacks? Can you draw clean energy from another location that is closer to Singapore? Is there another technology that can beat this proposal at cost and efficiency? First, a little background on our target city. Singapore is an island city-state sandwiched between Malaysia, Indonesia, and surrounded by the Strait of Malacca and South China Sea. It is a vital port city with a diverse economy, and with a population of 5.5 million, they certainly have a strong electricity demand. Right now, 95% of it comes from natural gas that is imported by neighboring countries. The rest comes from oil burning plants and some waste incinerators that capture the heat generated to make electricity. As stated before, there's zero room for any large solar farms. Offshore wind is problematic given the amount of shipping traffic going through the strait. Conventional nuclear plants are out of the question due to the amount of land required, among other things. So in a way, this limits Singapore's options. Sun Cable proposes the construction of a large solar farm in Australia's Northern Territory. It will be about 30,000 acres in size, and the nameplate capacity is expected to be around 20 gigawatts. To put that in perspective, the largest solar farm to date is the Badla Solar Park in India, with an installed capacity of over 2.7 gigawatts. In addition to the farm, they will also be making a battery storage system capable of storing up to 42 gigawatt hours of power, enough to flow electricity through the three gigawatt transmission line for 14 hours. Once completed, it will send three gigawatts of electricity 500 miles north to Darwin before connecting to a 2.2 gigawatt undersea cable. The cable will then transmit power through the Timor and Java Sea before finally reaching its destination. This will allow Singapore to source anywhere between 15 to 20% of its electricity from solar power. Now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about drawbacks. For starters, this is a tremendous undertaking. While the goals are admirable, I question whether the amount of money spent is worth the amount being imported. For $23 billion, you could build 10 gigawatts worth of combined cycle gas turbines with integrated carbon capture technology. That would meet roughly 80% of Singapore's energy needs. I get the goal is not to use fossil fuels, but if that's your concern, you need to address the storage issue. Details are fuzzy as to who's providing the energy storage system. Installed capacity aside, the capacity factor of the solar farm is a larger issue here. The best figures show the average capacity factor for large solar farms is somewhere between 25 and 30%. 
That means in the average best case scenario, you are not getting electricity 70% of the time from those solar panels. We don't have details as to how effective the storage system will be. And if it fails, that loss in power needs to be made up by the grid. Keep in mind, most of Australia's electricity comes from the burning of brown coal. Now, while this is a mature industry, I feel like something needs to be said about the cable itself. There are plenty of examples of existing power transmission projects using undersea cables, but the largest project to date is only a couple hundred miles long. We're sort of in uncharted territory here when it comes to distributing power at such distances. The cable is using high voltage direct current or HDVC and using HDVC, you are expected to lose 3% of the electricity for every thousand kilometers through transmission losses, which equates to a 10% loss of power out of the 2.2 gigawatt cable, which is simply unavoidable. And then there are the risks of power loss due to cable cuts. This could be a result of fishing activity as well as shipping traffic. While redundancies are being considered, you have to admit that this problem becomes exponential when you are connecting it to one of the busiest shipping lanes on planet Earth. Okay, now that I'm done crapping on Sun Cable, I should say that I understand the objective. However, if I take issue with the power link, it's only because they solve the problem by asking the wrong question, which is, how do we power Singapore with solar energy? This solution has a literal roundabout way of solving that, but it may not be the most cost effective. If they were to simply ask, how do we wean ourselves off of carbon emitting fuels, they might have looked somewhere else to solve their problem. Indonesia, for example, is right next door. Now, while they may not be investing in renewables at the same rate as Australia, they're certainly not as blessed with the same sunny weather, but they do have two things going for them, a desire to develop cleaner and cheaper sources of energy, as well as a government willing to help anyone who can deliver. Enter Thorcon Power. You may already know that they are looking to get thorium-fueled molten salt reactors to market ASAP, and are looking to build their first one in Indonesia. What you may not know is that they already have a site picked out. Just 500 kilometers from Singapore lies the island of Bangka. Housing a population of over 1 million people, this will be the first spot that will one day benefit from receiving their energy from thorium molten salt reactors. So here's my proposal. Instead of transmitting solar power from 2,800 miles away, let us transmit the same amount of power from Indonesia on an island 364 miles away, which equates to 13% of the original distance. You can reduce the amount of money needed for construction and implementation while also reducing the amount of power loss. You can also ensure a steady stream of power transmission with zero need for battery backup thanks to nuclear power's average 90% capacity factor. Now let's say Singapore goes with the suggestion, they try it out for a while and say, wow, this is great. We want to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels even further, but we don't want to import electricity. We want to build our own power stations. Would it be cost effective? Absolutely. Right now, Singapore has over 15 power plants with a total nameplate capacity of over 12 and a half gigawatts. Due to import tariffs, the city state's utility provider charges almost 22 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. That's almost double the US national average. Thorcon, with its ingenious approach to commercialization, is looking to build Thorcon plants for $1.2 billion per gigawatt. Operation costs would be around three cents per kilowatt hour. For $15 billion, Singapore could run their entire country on 100% clean energy using thorium-powered molten salt reactors. If we use the same budget allocated for Sun Cable, you would still have $8 billion left over to do whatever the hell you want. Now, I'm not sure how things will turn out. Assuming no delays, the project will be completed around the same time Thorcon has its day in the sun. Given time, maybe Singapore will take note and consider diversifying its energy needs by buying Thorcon plants. If they do, you can be damn sure we'll be covering it here. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this was Rock Logic.